All right, so sushi. Who doesn't love sushi, right? I mean, I could eat it every day, but <laughs> have you ever stopped to think about where this delicious dish came from? Buckle up, sushi lovers, because in this deep dive, we're taking a trip through the fascinating history of sushi. And it all starts with this really cool document, document1.pdf that you send over. You know, it's a really wild ride too, going from ancient times to the sushi we know and love today. By the end of this, you'll be looking at that spicy tuna roll in a whole new light, that's for sure. Oh, I'm intrigued. So where does this sushi story begin? Give us the rundown. Well, you might be surprised to hear that sushi wasn't actually invented in Japan. What? Yeah, it all started way back in the second century BC in Southeast Asia. Wow, okay, that's a curveball I wasn't expecting. <laughs> so what was sushi like back then? Was it the same delicious rolls we have now? Uh, oh, not quite. This early version was called Naira Zushi, and trust me, it was a completely different experience. And different how? Think fish fermented with rice for months. It was all about preservation. Months, wow, that's intense. You gotta wonder what that tasted like. It was definitely uh, unique, but you know, it's a testament to human ingenuity, right? And imagine no refrigerators back then, so fermenting food like this was a pretty clever way to make it last. Right, necessity is the mother of invention. So we go from ancient Southeast Asia to white, when does Japan enter the picture? Fast forward to around the 8th century, sushi makes its way east to Japan. And this is where things start to get really interesting. Okay, why is that? Well, rice already held a really important place in Japanese culture, even back then. So instead of just tossing out that fermented rice, the Japanese started eating it along with the fish. And that was a big shift. Interesting. It's like they saw the value in something others might have overlooked. Exactly. And that respect for rice runs deep in Japan. I mean, did you know rice was even used as currency in ancient Japan? Whoa, no way. I had no idea. So incorporating it into this new dish makes total sense though, right? Exactly. It was a natural fit. Okay, so we've got ancient Southeast Asia, then it hops over to Japan. Where does sushi go from there? Well, if you remember, that early narazushi involved months of fermentation, oh, right? Oh, definitely not fast food. Exactly. So over time people started to crave a faster, fresher sushi experience. Makes sense, taste change. And that's where Hayazushi comes in. This quicker version of sushi really took off during Japan's Edo period, which was between the 1600s and 1800s. Okay, the Edo period. Now I've definitely heard of it, but can you refresh my memory a bit? What was happening in Japan back then? Sure, so the Edo period was a time of major change for Japan. You had this rise of a merchant class, cities like Tokyo were booming, and people needed quick, convenient meals. Sounds familiar. Right, and that's where Hayazushi comes in. It was perfect for this new, on-the-go lifestyle. It was basically like the Edo period's version of fast food. I love that. It's amazing how food evolves right alongside society. So I'm guessing this is where things start to resemble the sushi we're all familiar with today. You're getting warmer. This is where sushi gets its next big makeover. Edo period Japan, that's when we start seeing the bite-sized pieces that we love today. You familiar with nigiri sushi? Oh, for sure. Nigiri, yeah, that's the classic hand-shaped sushi. It's like the image that pops into your head when you think sushi. Uh, exactly. And it was during the Edo period, 19th century, that this chef, Hanaya Yohei, completely changed the game with this brilliant invention. I mean, picture yourself in the middle of Edo era Tokyo, everything's bustling, and suddenly you can just grab at this delicious portable sushi from a street vendor. I can see it now. That's so cool. What did Yohei actually do that was so different? How did he shake things up? Well, before him, sushi was often served in bigger portions, right? But he got this idea to serve smaller individual pieces of that vinegared rice topped with, you know, fresh fish. Such a simple idea, but genius. Visually appealing, easy to eat on the go, and of course, crazy delicious. It really is amazing how such a small change can have such a huge impact. So speaking of impact, how did sushi go from the streets of Tokyo to, well, global domination? That's where the 20th century comes in. So right. after World War II, as Japan started, you know, re-engaging with the world, its culture and its food started to spread, sushi began appearing in Western cities, often in neighborhoods with Japanese communities. Right, so it starts as a taste of home, basically. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but I have to imagine, raw fish, that wasn't everyone's cup of tea initially. Did people kind of hesitate to try it? Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, you have to put yourself in their shoes. For a lot of people in the West, eating raw fish, that was a totally alien concept. It took some time, for sure, for those flavors and the whole idea of it to catch on. I bet the California roll played a big role in that, right? It's like the gateway sushi. Bingo. California yeah. roll, you've got crab, avocado, cucumber, all familiar ingredients 
genius, really. Mm. A delicious, approachable entry point for anyone a little hesitant about diving headfirst into you know, a piece of raw fish. Yeah, it's pretty ingenious how food can adapt and change to different cultures and tastes. So, okay, California roll brings sushi to the West, and then what happens? And then, boom, explosion. Sushi goes from this niche thing to a mainstream sensation. Yeah. Celebrities are eating it. People focused on health are eating it. Foodies are all over it. Suddenly you've got sushi restaurants everywhere, every corner you turn with endless options. It's incredible. It's not just California rolls anymore, that's for sure. I mean, in document one.pdf, there was all this talk about maki, tamaki, chirashi, so many kinds of sushi. Right, and that's mm -hmm. part of what makes it so great. It's incredibly versatile. You've got maki, your classic seaweed wrapped rolls, tomaki, those fun cone shaped things, chirashi, which is that beautiful bowl of sushi rice with all sorts of toppings. I mean, the options are endless. It's true. Each piece is like its own little edible work of art. It's no wonder sushi has captured everyone's imagination. It really is. It's a testament to the sushi chefs too, you know? They're artists. They've taken this ancient food tradition and they keep innovating, refining, making it even better. And speaking of innovation, where do you think sushi goes from here? What's next for this culinary superstar? So where do you see this culinary art form going next? What does the future of sushi look like? Well, one thing's for sure, we're gonna be seeing a lot more emphasis on sustainability. I mean, with all the concerns about overfishing and the environment, Chefs and diners are really starting to prioritize responsibly sourced seafood. Yeah, for sure. Sustainability is a big deal these days. Absolutely. And it's not just about protecting our oceans. It's about making sure we can keep enjoying sushi for years to come, right? Chefs are getting really creative too. More locally sourced seasonal ingredients and even some pretty interesting plant-based alternatives are starting to pop up on menus. Plant-based sushi, huh? Now that's something I'll have to look out for. It's pretty wild. They're able to get those same textures and flavors you expect from traditional sushi, but using all plant-based stuff. Yeah. But it's not just about sustainability either. I mean, chefs are always pushing the boundaries, right? You see all these new flavors, influences from different cultures being woven into sushi. Fusion cuisine is huge right now. Oh, totally. What kind of fusion sushi is trending these days? Any favorites? Well, Latin American inspired sushi seems to be having a moment. Oh, wow. What's that like? Think like ceviche flavors, aji amarula sauces, maybe even a little plantain thrown in there. That sounds amazing, actually. It really is incredible how sushi can be both this traditional thing and this ever-evolving food. It's true. It just goes to show food is so much more than just sustenance, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. a reflection of culture, history, creativity. Think about it. What started as a way to preserve fish in Southeast Asia all those centuries ago has become this global phenomenon. It's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. And the best part is, the journey's not over yet. Who knows what incredible sushi creations the future holds? That is mind-blowing. It really makes you appreciate every bite. Well, that was an incredible deep dive into the world of sushi. Thanks to document1.pdf, we went from ancient preservation techniques to, well, plantain in our sushi. Who knew? It's amazing, isn't it? Makes you wonder what stories are hiding behind all the other foods we eat every day. There you go. Something to chew on, listeners. Next time you're enjoying some sushi, take a minute to think about the journey it took to get to your plate. You might be surprised what you discover. Till next time on The Deep Dive, keep exploring and keep learning.